Welcome back. This is week five, lecture two, Humanism and Reform. Um, and I will try, as I promised, to keep this lecture um, as short as possible in light of uh, part one, or not part one, but the, the first lecture for this week. Um, there'll be aspects that I've left out, which I had originally intended to include in this lecture, but I'll be come back to later. Uh, but it is important to not just skip this lecture at all, because humanism, and in the broader sense, the Renaissance, was to a context of the Reformation, both the Reformation of the later Middle Ages and then when we get to Luther next week, um, with Luther and his theology and his emerging movement and what was going on at the time and all those different aspects. So we need to see it in that context. Now, just as I've said before, that the first uh, lecture or so on the structures of Christendom is really squeezing my entire early medieval course into one lecture or so, and then the lectures thereafter are squeezing my high and late medieval Europe um, course into a few different lectures. This, too, there's a course that I've taught um, not for quite a long time, and that's another issue, on the Renaissance into one shortened, abbreviated lecture. So keep that in mind that this is not really a complete portrayal of the Renaissance at, at all, but there are aspects of it that we need to address in order to understand what was going on at the time. Because so often just the, the problem of the Renaissance is that so often we see it distinct from or it has been seen as distinct from the later Middle Ages. And so in terms of the emergence of modernity, and this then gets into your um, final essay was the uh, Reformation uh, uh, Revolution, meaning when did it change? Was this Reformation of the later Middle Ages part of a thing that was separate from a Renaissance in terms of modernity? Were these two different aspects coming together to contribute to the emergence of modernity? Or was it all part of the same kind of thing? And I would argue that the Renaissance was a late medieval development. It was a movement within the later Middle Ages, and we can't understand it and won't understand it historically unless we see it as a late medieval development. The term the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, actually was a historiographical term. It is a term that was coined by um, um, Jakob Burkhardt in 18. The 1860s, I think it was. He's a Swiss historian. Wrote this classic, a classic work, um, a brilliant work, the, the Civilization of, Rudis, uh, of Italy in the Renaissance, or something like that. Uh, I forget the precise title. Um, but it's even been said that the Renaissance sprang from Burkhardt's head like uh, Athena from the head of Zeus, um, because he saw in the sources something new. Now, we could talk a lot about Burkhart. Um, a lot of the denigration of the Middle Ages comes from Burkhart because Burkhart tended to accept the interpretation of the Middle Ages or that which came before these new developments that he was seeing of the scholars at the time themselves. So looking at 15th century Italian scholars and their view of the disparaging things they had said about their forebearers, Burkhardt seemed to take that as reality. And that, that is a phenomenon we'll see too with Luther, and then also in terms of just historians uh, often, um, we accept a, a historical evaluation as then actually being part, I mean, historical meaning a previous a contemporary evaluation as being uh, accurate of the historical time. That's not the case. Now, I'm not saying that there was no such thing as a Renaissance. We could debate that. Um, the question the question also in the original lecture I was going to uh, talk a fair amount about uh, towards the end was uh, a very famous question asked by Joan Wallach Scott. Um, did women have a Renaissance? I was like, nope, absolutely not. This was a male movement um, by the, at least we can say the elite. Um, it's very complex in terms of it's not just the nobility. That was one of the things that the um, the plague, the Black Death, made possible, was opening up all these opportunities for what was called the new men to make their impact on the political situation in Italy, especially. That's a whole other issue. We can get into that in terms of the, the Renaissance as a chorus. 
so there were new developments that were different from what had come before, but let's, we see them in context of this late medieval crisis, and in some ways see the Renaissance as part of this late medieval crisis. We won't understand what was going on, and we'll understand what's going on with Luther. And the major question, too, not only has been with Luther, was Luther an Augustinian, meaning not just a member of the Augustinian order, but did he develop his... Um, his theology based on his imbibing a late medieval Augustinianism. It's also been asked, was he a humanist? Because there were humanism, humanism was being prevalent and taking off at this time. And I'll be talking about that too. And why it's necessary to talk about humanism, because so often the Renaissance and humanism are seen as one and the same. But the term humanism is problematic. So often it's seen as, at least in, in, out there in general, not by scholars of the Renaissance, but even, but there too, even actually, it's seen as what we can almost call secular humanism uh, of contemporary from the 1960s on secular humanism, which is a focus on the individual. It is almost explicitly atheistic and elevates humans as the epitome of everything. That is not Renaissance humanism at all. Not at all. Now, we'll talk, we can talk a lot about that. I don't want to spend too much time um, because I don't want this lecture to drag out uh, at all. But one of the things that was a new um, development was indicative of that which has been labeled as the Renaissance, and the Renaissance simply means a rebirth. And that rebirth, that renaissance, a rebirth of what? In, in, this, in this context, it was of classical ideals, classical culture, classical models that the scholars in, the, in Italy in the later 14th century and into the 15th century, um, in the north of the Alps later on too, uh, in the 16th century, saw as having been ignored by this long period of a dark age between ourselves today in Italy and what had come uh, between us and classical antiquity. And there, there was only one long, dark middle age, a middle age between us today, affecting a rebirth of classical civilization. That's where we get this the complete denigration of the middle ages. And that's where we get the term, the middle age, medium ivum in Latin. And Burkhart's then interpretation of that has set the stage. And so in some ways, this lecture is intended to attempt to correct the ahistorical understanding of an historical development, if that makes any sense. You say, oh, you're being a revisionist. Yes, I am being a revisionist. I'm certainly trying to be, because it needs to be revised based on our understanding. Now, so much for that. What remains is this concept of a rebirth and what brought about this concept of rebirth a return to the sources the original sources odd fontes that was almost the hallmark of what has been called the renaissance and i've already addressed that to an extent when i talked about the augustinian renaissance and we could talk a lot about and i could uh, I would try to persuade all of you to, to see that the Augustinian Renaissance was a contributing factor to and preceded the Italian Renaissance. But that's not the point I want to make here. The point I want to make here is both for the Augustinian Renaissance, which was a return to the original sources of Augustine. That was much broader to a return to the original sources of classical antiquity not just relying on quotable quotes and things because that had been done all along, um, but really trying to say we need to follow the model and ideals of the ancients. Now, another great scholar, Richard Southern, wrote a, a two-volume work called uh, Medieval uh, Scholasticism and Humanism, Medieval Scholastical Scholasticism and Humanism, which argues that these two movements, scholasticism, meaning the teaching at the universities, which I talked about uh, last lecture, and humanism kind of grew up together, and that 
you know, there was nothing that was all that new about the Renaissance. Not to say that there was nothing new about the Renaissance is going too far, in my view. But to say that everything that was positive and good and leading to modernity just began into the Renaissance and that everything before was dark and ignorant and simply an age of faith was ridiculous as well. Now, that being said, Odd Fontes, the return to the sources. Let's look at this core aspect of what made the Renaissance the Renaissance. Uh, so I have up here the new slide. Odd Fontes. I say the pursuit of classical models. If that was be like one definition of the Renaissance, it was the pursuit of classical models in an attempt to affect a rebirth of antiquity. And the next point up there is textual criticism and language. And the problem there is how do we go about doing so? Um, because language changes over time. And Ciceronian Latin was um, not the Latin that was being spoken and written and read in the 13th century. Ciceronian Latin is not the Latin of the universities and scholasticism. And these Italian humanists are compared to Cicero. Who, if you don't know, he was a, a, a Roman statesman, philosopher, and lawyer, um, and was generally seen, even at the time, as being the uh, best writer of Latin prose ever to have lived. Um, so it's like, really, is is this ideal of Cicero? If we're going to follow models, we should follow Cicero as the very best example of how to write Latin. Problem is, the scholastic Latin was very far from the Latin of Cicero. So that was just seen as lesser, as debased, as wrong. And there became to be this sense of if you're going to be educated, if you're going to be with it, so to speak, if you're going to show that you were in the know, the only way you can do that is to show that you can imitate Cicero. So Ciceronian Latin became the model for prose, for Latin prose. And we have to keep in mind, too, that even though the vernacular is being used here and there, Latin is still the common language for the educated elite, okay, for scholarship, for education from through all levels, uh, for diplomacy, everything is being done in Latin. For poetry, then it was Virgil, because Virgil was the greatest poet of Latin ever to have lived. So we have these two models, Cicero and Virgil, that were held up in the whole point of humanist education, I'll get back to that term, the definition of that term, became, can we imitate Cicero and Virgil? These are these goals, these models, these standards of Latinity or the use of language that were seen to say are, the quality of our speech, the quality of our thoughts, the quality of our literature, what we write, what we do, is can be judged only by the standards of Cicero and Virgil. Now, Petrarch was the first poet, Petrarch in the 14th century, Italian scholar Petrarch, I think I talked about him in the Italian Renaissance, or the Augustinian Renaissance lecture a little bit, uh, the first scholar to write an epic poem um, in in classical meter since antiquity, and he did so following Virgil, his Africa. That's what gave him, uh, allowed him to be crowned the poet laureate. Um, and that's a whole other story about Petrarch and everything, which I would love to get into, but again, I'm trying to keep this as brief as possible, and therefore you're probably saying too, and you're talking way too fast. Um, but you can always go back and try to catch up and listen. <laughs> again, I'm sorry, that kind of undermines the whole point of trying to keep this lecture short, so my apologies for that. There's just too much exciting material to get in here. Um, it was hard for me to leave things out, but I'm leaving most things out, actually, so we'll just go from there. But the point is, and I've said that the, the Renaissance humanists, the, the humanism with this idea of language, they actually killed Latin. They killed it. Latin was a living, vibrant language, evolving, and that's what scholastic Latin is all about. It's evolving, adapting language as language always is. It would be like to say today, okay, who's the best author of English who's ever lived? Most people would say Shakespeare. Okay, so 
if you're going to be with it, if you're going to be intelligent, if you're going to show that you're well-educated, you have to write like Shakespeare. So in this class, from this moment on, all of you are going to have to write your papers in Shakespearean English. And they'll be graded based on how close to Shakespearean English you get. And that's a problem. First of all, footnote, I hope no one heard that and think, oh my God, do we really have to do that? No, of course not. But that would be what it would be like if this was um, an analogous view, because we'd be holding up Shakespeare as the standard that we have to imitate. It wasn't fitting for the time. And it's not fitting for our time to say that we have to write Shakespeare. Um, I couldn't do it either. Don't worry. <laughs> so anyway, the point being, it solidified a living language into a couple of models that were then concrete and set. Now, that's kind of an overarching statement. But they could get very nasty about it too. The Renaissance humanists and Italians about how how better, much better they were than anybody who couldn't write sufficient. Ciceronian Latin. Um, not the nicest of people, actually. Um, but it led to then this emphasis on texts. And that's one of the other aspects of, you know, as mentioned Petrarch and what he did, because he wanted to follow classical models. Um, and he sought out manuscripts, and he discovered works that had been lost, that indeed had been lost, works from from classical antiquity, uh, Latin antiquity, basically, um, and rediscovered them and brought them to light. So this was a new, exciting endeavor, it's discovery. And the medieval scholars were damned for having gotten rid of these texts and covered them up. Um, I could talk a lot about that in terms of the manuscript transmission and things. It's a fascinating and process and development um, and important for our understanding how uh, literature is transmitted, how manuscripts are transmitted, how we know anything at all about classical culture. But that's a separate issue in some ways. So is focusing on language, focusing on classical language and with the models of Cicero and Virgil as the standards and focusing on finding and copying and disseminating classical texts and discovering new ones if we can. Let's go out looking for manuscripts of X. And they were found. They were found. Now, that was the thing. And if we want to look back at the... Um, Augustinian Renaissance, there's that element there too. I think I mentioned the um, the sermons to his uh, brothers in the, in the Hermitage, the Sermones of Fratres and Erimo, uh, with Jordan's including that in his Collectania. Now, there is another manuscript uh, by Robert de Barris in Paris in 1343, um, a collection of these sermons, the Sermones of Fratres and Erimo, and I've argued that it's the uh, equally early version of the collection as Jordan's, but they had a common source. And what Nabartus says is that these sermons were discovered in Paris. He's out looking for more Augustinian manuscripts. What was Petrarch doing? Looking for classical texts. It's the same approach. We turn to the sources. We need to discover them. Re make them live again. That's this rebirth concept. And we're going to do so by being philologists. Philologists is the study, are the study, the study of language and how language transforms and evolves. And we'll come back to that later. Um, and we're going to teach this. We find the origins of modern textual criticism in the Renaissance. And we could also say it goes all the way back to the Carolingian Renaissance, but for our purposes and there's reasons for that, but it really does begin with the Renaissance comparison of manuscripts, the beginning of the discussion of authenticity, and on we go. So if we're going to affect a rebirth of classical culture, if we are going to bring about a Renaissance of antiquity, we need to teach it. That's the problem. What was one of the great things about classical antiquity? The focus on virtu, on virtue, on virtus in Latin, um, both for the Greeks and for the Romans, this concept of the individual human being, 
How do we know those things? By studying their literature, the history, the poetry, the drama, by looking at ethical behavior and activity. All of these things were not being taught at the university. In the medieval university, which I talked about last lecture, you could not take a course in history, in ancient history. You couldn't talk, take a course in Roman literature or Greek literature. You could not take a course really in ethics. You might, they might be able to listen to a lecture on Aristotle's ethics later on, but not at first. What this new focus of study was called was the study of humanity, the studia humanitatis, the study of humanity. Humanity, humanitas in Latin, and the, 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 the genitive is humanitatis. So it's the studia humanitatis, the study of humanity became the paradigmatic educational program of these people who were trying to bring about a renaissance of classical antiquity. Just as if you were teaching the arts at a university, you were called an, art or an artist. If you were teaching law or practicing law, you were called a legist. So if you were teaching the humanities, which is where this all comes from. If you're talk, teaching the humanities, the studia humanitatis, the study of humanity, the humanities or the study of humanity, you were called a humanist, someone who taught the human studies or the human disciplines or the humaniora, as they were also called, the more human disciplines of literature, history, ethics, poetry. This was all going about outside the university. It was not part of the university, but it became a hallmark of then this new educational movement of the humanities, including history, as the study of humanity. And then in the 19th century, not only with Burkhart, but with other Germans, we find the ism I've already referred to, I think, about the isms. And we have not just the humanists, but we have humanism, humanismus, through humanismus, and on we go, that turned a descriptive term into some substantive thing of humanism. It's a warping of our understanding all the way around. So what we're really looking at, I would like to kind of avoid the term humanism, except if we have to use it, we should know that Renaissance humanism refers explicitly to and only to the writings, the, the evidence that exists, the movement of the humanists who were the teachers of the humanities based on classical models and the the, the, the drive to return to the original sources. That's kind of it in a nutshell. It had nothing to do with being against the church. It had nothing to do with being against religion or faith or theology whatsoever. There was not a single Renaissance humanist who claimed that Christianity was not the divine truth. There were humanists who were critical of the institutional church, but in the later 14th on into the 15th century, a lot of people were. Not based on humanism, but based on what they saw at the time of a general problem, a general crisis resulting from the plague, from the schism, and on we go. It gets to be very complex, but that's what I want you to see. That this is not a secular movement in the terms what we think of as secular. And that's the other problem. We think secular means not religious. Where, and it did in the Middle Ages and in the, on into the 14th, 15th century, the Renaissance and, and the Reformation, secular meant not religious. That meant if you were a secular priest, you were a priest who was not a member of a religious order, a monastic order. I've already talked about entering in statu religionis, in the legal state of being a religious. And a secular meant not being that. You were every 
parish priest. Most bishops were secular bishops, secular priests. Sec seculum meant the world. They were in the world. The religious were supposed to be withdrawn from the world. And what we see happening, and this we see with Jordan already, and I already referred to this in different contexts, we see this view of this monastic withdrawal focus on the religious life. We see that then being applied to everybody within the seculum, with everybody in society, within secular society. And that's why I think I, I referred to the, the, the image of monastic piety spilling over the walls of the monastery, or in Jordan's terms, whereby every Christian should be a saint. It is the sense of catechesis not just for the group itself, but for everybody. We should all be saints and know what's going on and take our faith seriously. The humanists did that as well, very consciously so. So don't ever think that this is a distinction between being religious or being non-religious. Secular did not mean that at the time. It means that now. It did not mean that at the time. A di very different use of these terms. And you can't mix them up or you won't understand what was going on in the developments. So that is the, the term uh, or the, the, the nutshell of what humanism and the humanists were in the return on Fontes. And how does this all play into our concerns for this course? Well, one of the aspects is that we have both Italian humanism, is it so-called, where it really developed this idea of teaching the humanities. And then as that movement spread north of the Alps, let's talk about northern humanism as kind of distinct from Italian humanism. And too much has been made of this distinction as well. But there were some differences in emphases. And I have, I have up there Italian humanism and northern humanism. The first bullet point, so to speak, is Greek, Latin, Dash, and Hebrew. Those were the three classical languages. And in Italy, the Italian humanists, it was Latin, first of all, and then increasingly Greek came into the, the picture. And especially after the Council of Basel, if you remember, talking about conciliarism, 1431 to 1439, we have a contingent from Constantinople attending the, the Council of Basel. There are Greek scholars because Constantinople was predominantly, overwhelmingly Greek speaking. And they came to the Council of Basel and some of them stayed and taught Greek. So especially as we go into the 15th century, Greek becomes even more important in the Italian Renaissance. And consequently too, by that time, humanism the study of the hum of humanity and the of the humanities had gone had spread north of the Alps, and so it, there too it was the context of hey, you know what? Here we study theology. There's not there's not a famous theological faculty in Italy. The theological faculty was Paris, and then maybe Oxford. The law faculty was Bologna. So if you studied law, you went to Bologna. If you studied theology, you went to Paris. Or if you couldn't go to Paris, you went to Oxford. Way in the north. And for biblical humanism, there's also been talked about biblical humanism. That means a return to the original languages. Latin, everybody knew Latin. The Vulgate was in Latin. But the Latin was a translation of the Greek. So Greek, Latin, and then Hebrew. So there was a renewed emphasis on Hebrew. Now, biblical scholarship um, throughout the Middle Ages always knew that those were the biblical languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And if you didn't really know all three, you were not as good. And in the 12th century, the school of St. Victor, there was an emphasis on Hebrew uh, uh, studies and Hebrew knowledge. But that really takes off, just like with Greek, in the fifth, 14th, later 14th, 15th century with the study of Hebrew and the study of Greek. So that is this context of to be fully educated, you need to be the homo trilinguus, as it was called, the, the, the man who could handle three languages, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And Italy is more of just Greek and Latin. But then with the northern 
climbs over the Alps, Hebrew was added as well. So there's this context of the biblical language as being essential to biblical scholarship, but this is still outside the university context. Um, it was then beginning to be an approach to say we need to, to introduce some of these studies into the university. Now, it's not until the, the mid or to the late 15th century that we have the first chair of poetry north of the Alps in the university. And that was also extracurricular. It wasn't part of the required curriculum, but it was allowed um, a scholar who'd studied in Italy to come and to give lectures in the University um, uh, of Heidelberg, I believe it was, uh, on, on poetry. But that was a long fought battle and problem. There was also opposition to the study of Hebrew and everything else. It was kind of a mess. But it began to be seen as this is basic to our theological understanding because the Bible is essential to our theological understanding and if languages are essential to our understanding of the Bible, we better get our act in order. So that became this complex of what was going on there. Now, also in terms of the teaching aspect, because humanism was teaching first and foremost, the humanities. There was a group called the Modern Devotion, the Devotio Moderna, that is a widespread kind of multifaceted development, and but it's been seen as um, uh, the seat of more also elementary education at the time, pre-university education to teach humanism to students. So when they go to the university, they'll already have kind of a classical education. That was kind of overblown. Um, the number of congregations of the Devotio Moderna that really were engaged in teaching were not that that many. What the movement was primarily in the Netherlands and in southern or in northern Germany was this monastic piety, this kind of Jordan's concept of everybody should be religious, but for lay people. It was saying we are not going to officially join a monastic order, but we're going to live a common life. We're going to follow a rule. We'll go about our business. We'll keep our jobs, but we're going to pool things together in our own individual devotion. We'll take private vows to ourselves, but do so collectively. Now, there was part of this devotio moderna or the modern devotion that then even went one step further and said, no, we will be a monastic form of life ourselves. And they were the brothers and sisters of the common life, as they were called. But the modern devotion is this larger view with the brothers and sisters of the common life being a more specific view, um, focus a more monastic view. But they were doing what Jordan was calling for. They were trying to live a holy life based on a monastic model, but not monastic. Very important movement for understanding the, the popular culture at the time, because this had a major influence not only in the region of the Netherlands and northern Germany, but also then spread further along um, as, as we go. And it's interesting to note that of Jordan's manuscripts, his extant manuscripts, um, not all of them, but there are the, the majority of some of them anyway, originated in the Netherlands or northern Germany. So there's a very strong interest within the Devotio uh, Moderna in the works of Jordan. It was being copied and followed and, and, and spread around. That gets to be a little bit more um, or off the, the, the beaten path from what we need to focus on. So I want to get this wrapped up as quickly as I possibly can. Uh, okay, so that's what we're looking at. Another aspect of this renaissance, there is a focus on rhetoric. If we look to the universities, as I already I think, portrayed it, the focus was on logic and debate and trying to logically show the fallacies of your opponent, whereas rhetoric was the approach for law. Because if we think about it, Cicero was a lawyer. What do lawyers have to do? Persuade. What is the discipline of persuasion? Rhetoric is what lawyers need to be able to do, is to persuade people. And I have up there the, the phrase that became 